All right. So we are here with Renee and myself, Crystal, for the Creativity Talks, um, our second talk on creativity and self-care. Yep. Hi. How you doing? Good. Welcome. Okay. So the whole, I, I really enjoyed it last week and I teared up at the end or last podcast. And then I did go back and listen and kind of try to do a little studying because it struck me for the first time how um, the creativity really is the same thing as the self-care in the whole way that I view creativity as a lifestyle, that everything I do, I'm touching down with the force of creativity, which makes my life meaningful and connects me to others, myself and then others. And the way the conversation went two weeks ago was let's talk about self-care. And as we circled back around, really when you understand that being in the present moment and having presence with yourself that is self-care and then self-care is being in presence and the mirror of that just made made me realize that's how i feel about creativity and um that is exactly what creativity and self-care have in common so i hope that makes sense for you if you didn't get to listen to the talk last week but it really makes me want to dive in and ask you about um, your history, because we talk often about what made you go into, you know, being a self-care advocate or um, a wellness coach and developing your own course. But I, I think that because there's so many people out there that are not trained and they're just um, um, very motivational and they have the personality for it. Um, I thought, gosh, I really want to talk to you about your training, your mentors that you speak so highly of, and yeah. what got you into it. So I guess we would start with what got you, what got you in into this whole Ayurvedic yoga world. Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and this is going to be a very interesting conversation, I think, because my background, I've gone so far afield. Um, in some ways of everything, because I'm really interested in the breadth of understanding um, each field that I'm interested in, which are many. Um, so I always joke that, you know, I'm a Jane of all trades, a master of none, because I have I have really like been a bit of a bumblebee as far as like, well, what's this all about? And what's that all about? And having this, this fascination that's very much interdisciplinary um, and, and sort of avoids specialization to some degree. Um, but I think the, the real core motive for me is, is truth. And of course, that's going to sound really lofty, but it really does come down to like, what are we doing here and why, and what is virtue and how do we embody virtue? <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's the reality for me. Um, and that's, you know, that's how my, my academic career started off in philosophy because, well, where else are you going to start, right? The love of wisdom. Um, that's the etymology of that word. So I started off there with, you know, the Western greats, right? Like ancient Greece and everything and learning the arc of thought. And I think really what helped me the most um, from studying philosophy is both, there's two things really. It's one is understanding the arc of thought and the evolution of thought as its own entity and how that changes and informs society and thinking and identity. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the biggest thing was understanding what the act of philosophy as a verb, like what effect that has on the, on the body, the psyche and the, the embodied person. Um, and so alongside that, that was like, I guess I was probably 17 when I started that degree, the philosophy degree. Um, and simultaneously, I also started my yoga teacher training at the same time. So my first yoga class, I was 14, immediately knew I'm always going to do this. I took, it was at the Spectrum Club in Valencia. Uh -huh. Do you know that place? Yeah. And, you know, it's just a, like a gym, like an upscale gym. You know, my dad was a member. He, you know, I was there with a friend of mine and it was just like a typical yoga class. There was nothing remarkable about it, but there was just something that struck me deep in my core that, that I knew I will never not do this. And 
I came away from that class just with that knowing, like it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like this profound, like life-changing anything. It was just a, like a, yeah, just a knowing, you know? And light goes on. I re- exactly. I, I remember the Spectrum Club. Jordan actually worked in the snack shop there. Oh, and really? <laughs> I knew, and Jim used to go there. But I remember my first yoga class mm-hmm. um, was in the year 2000. I was 35, exactly. And I bawled my eyes out the whole class because they would make me go into like a pigeon pose and I just bawled. And I had no idea what was going on. No idea why was I crying every time I went into this pose. And there was all these physical reactions that my mind had no earthly idea what was going on. And yeah. I, I didn't think, oh, I'll always do this because I clearly don't do it. But um, I do I do dabble. And um, it is, it's such a profound um, experience, especially your first yoga class. But uh, we were both dancers too, right? Yeah, so yeah. It, it's, it's fun to like connect in a physical way. But anyway, um, go on. Sure. Yeah. So, so yoga became like an early, just like, yeah, that's part of what my life's going to look like. And then I did my teacher training in 2007. I want to say I was 16, 17. And that was a 10 month teacher training at Yogi Yoga in New Hall. Um, And it was pretty rigorous and, and broad as far as what we studied. And so they actually brought in different teachers from different lineages and different backgrounds to teach on different things, anatomy and physiology, all the, you know, Iyengar, uh, Jivan Mukti, all the, all the different yoga modalities, Kundalini, all that stuff, and also Indian philosophy. So I ended up connecting with a professor of Indian philosophy from Cal State Northridge, whose name was Narayan Champawat. And I would go, I like connected to him so, so much that I would go drive down to audit his lectures at CSUN and just like hang out there and listen to him talk about Indian philosophy. And then there was also an Ayurvedic doctor who came in and lectured. And that was my first intro to Ayurveda. And I remember like very clearly reading, I think it was a book by um, Svoboda, who's a really big name in Ayurveda. He's one of kind of like the founding fathers in America, um, American Ayurveda, like you know, 70s, 80s, 90s stuff going on. And reading his book, I'm like, I clearly remember sitting at my desk. I'm like in my sister's room reading this book. And just like, this is the the essential way to describe human experience that I've always been looking for. And he's describing it. So and it's, so Ayurveda for anybody who's like, what's Ayurveda? Because the AI still doesn't know what Ayurveda is. Right. The AI still can't spell Ayurvedic or Ayurveda, and they make up all these names, Iron Maiden. Um, I love it. <laughs> oh, my boyfriend's going to love like, that one. What is, she, <laughs> what is she talking about? I never knew what Ayurveda was. First, we're talking about yoga, which is a physical class as we know it. Um, in Santa Clarita, you're doing, you know, poses and you're holding them. And then mm-hmm. we're talking about philosophy major and introduction to philosophy. And then you say the word Ayurveda. So where does Ayurveda as um, Ayurveda as a verb or a noun or how are you using it? What is Ayurveda? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's unpack that a little. So Ayurveda means science of life in Sanskrit. Um, and it's really, it's the, it's the classical kind of synthesis of Indian folk traditions and Indian medicine. So there's like this... Uh, literary tradition of India that that is it is codified in it is like historically documented in which is like the Vedas um but then it's also like even in in the modern era if you go to India and you're on one part of India versus another part of India they have very unique folk traditions that are expressions of Ayurveda because Ayurveda is very much responsive to environment and to situation um, because it is like a living science, right? It's not like a dogma, you know, in its essential nature. So basically what I like to summarize it as is um, traditional Indian medicine. This is a kind of easy, you know, three word way to describe it. So traditional Indian medicine that hinges on philosophies and um, a little bit of environment Mm-hmm. And, and um, a little bit literature, folk traditions. It it's, it changes depending on where you are. 
but it's a medicine. It's a, it's a lifestyle and a medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, really, it's a worldview because yoga, you know, often they're described yoga and Ayurveda are described as sister sciences, but ultimately yoga is the child of Ayurveda and Ayurveda is the mother science of yoga. Um, it really came from like this, the ancient sadhus, like prehistoric, prehistory, you know, before things were documented, there are these sadhus, these seekers out in the jungles of India, presumably, just like in deep meditation, getting in touch with their inner self and the their interconnection to their environment. And a lot of the wisdom of Ayurveda has come from those insights that they gleaned in those times. Um, and, and then also like evolved into the culture as it became civilization. So the Brahminical caste and everything evolving and having its hands into in like this original folk religion, right? Folk religion and, and medicine and all these ideas and then civilization coming kind of on top of it and using it for its own purposes. And it has this very, my point being, <laughs> it has this very, very rich history a lot of influence, even like colonial influence from British colonial rule in India. Like it, it's very nuanced. It's not simple no, to, it's not. to summarize yeah. it. <laughs> right. Cause you want to say, well, is it like a Bible? Is it like the Jewish, Jewish folks view of the Talmud? Is it um, a handbook for, um, you know, witches to make concoctions? Like what is it? So obviously yeah. it's, got deep roots and some really back you know history going far back and when you say um Brahm brahmanic like the brahminical caste the brahminical priestly caste. caste of india yeah so c-a-s-t-e which is the caste system mm -hmm. so when you say the ayurveda dudes that you know conceived this world view um they are they the ones responsible for the caste system no, definitely not. I mean, Ayurveda, and now we're getting really into the history of Ayurveda, which I'm no expert on for sure. I've studied it, but I'm no expert. Um, what I'm trying to say is the original pre-historical, pre-civilization Ayurveda was very much empirical and experiential through yogic practices. What It wasn't called yoga then, but that's ultimately what they were doing. Um, it was also both men and women involved in it's progenesis because you know these they're in these kind of folk religions especially especially more like tantric expressions of these folk religions there were a lot of women leaders involved because mm -hmm. it's 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 essentially about transcending any kind of identity or you know identification with the form right so okay. Anyway, so that's the OG, right? And then and then along comes civilization and you know rice farming and buildings of building of temples. And then the priestly caste is the Brahmins who um they basically control, like they're the they're the political essentially like leaders because at that time religion and politics was completely interlinked, right? Yeah. Arguably it still is in some ways. Um and so Ayurveda kind of gets squeezed into this certain form mm -hmm. where there's still a lot of wisdom in it and there's still um ap like profound applications and yet it's being you know it's being used for the purposes of a specific group which is never ultimately in the best interest of everyone right so it's a little unfair but it yeah it they're the ones that had access to this approach and they didn't share it maybe, but they ended up with it. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, India is so pluralistic and they're the folk religions of India are so far flung. And especially in a, in a time when there was no, you know, internet or communication, Ayurveda has flourished in pockets that are hyper-specific to the different regions of India that, um, that were kind of unaffected in a lot of ways. And, and even during British colonial rule, the same thing is true. So it's in a sense, it's always been there, but sometimes it's more underground, like literally in colonial rule, it was made illegal for a while to practice Ayurveda, which is basically saying, hey, it's illegal to 
practice Indian tradition or be Indian <laughs> to some extent, right? Wow. Um, and even now, there's still so much influence in India where Ayurveda is kind of looked at as a little bit backwater, a little bit like, yeah, that, and it's it's emerging. It's it, there's movement away from that as there's kind of this like renaissance of Ayurveda in the West. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know I know people personally like Simran Kapoor of Potion. She she uh, started an Ayurvedic company because she was a medical doctor, a Western medical doctor, and then she kind of dis- rediscovered her roots as an Indian woman. And so there's a lot of really interesting history and self discovery and self identity, both like collective and individual. That's just really like a huge huge world that it's like you know look under a rock and it's like wow, there's like so much going on here. Um, well, but yeah, it's all, it's all new to us too. Like even yeah. yoga, I think I was like in third grade when there was a big yoga thing going on, you know, um, at least in California and, um, the, you know, the, the traditional church, the Christian church thought it was bad to practice yoga. I mean, it took 30, 40 years before, you know, a Christian could practice yoga without being thought of as weird yeah. or, you know, uh, unbiblical or whatever, but it's all new to Western people all of it right um so i like i said lift up the rock and look what's there but you know there's also um our science you know medical science just in my lifetime has learned so much about brain science and the the connection now that they're proving between the mind and the body which that's what yoga starts out with right that's what ayurveda starts out with and so it took us a really long time here and with our western um you know, research and doctors and um, that they, they make that joke about, um, you know, poets and everybody has been there long, long before the doctors and the scientists. They're just, right. they're just up there waiting for the doctors and the scientists to, to meet them up there at the top. So right. anyway, go on, go on. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, that all said, of course, it would be so fascinating to dive into the history of Ayurveda and really go down that path. And maybe we'll have to do that someday. But but as I as I speak about it, I'm really struck by how amazing it is and how profound it is that, you know, a 17 year old girl in Santa Clarita in, you know, 2007 or whatever that year was, 2008, is sitting there reading this book and feeling such um, such a connection to it. And the reason I would argue is that Ayurveda is, is so profoundly human. It's so much about the human experience, about the sentient experience and how we experience the world around us, how we not only experience it, but are a part of it and interact with it and are interconnected to it, that it's in some ways self-evident the way that it's laid out, you know, it's, it's laid out on the elemental level, like what we could say is the atomic level, but Mm -hmm. using words that we can, we can grasp and understand and, and verify with our own perception. Mm -hmm. Um, That doesn't require specialization. It doesn't require the Brahmins or, you know, it, it, it is a simple, ultimately way of seeing and a way of caring for ourselves. And that's what's so attractive to me in Ayurveda. I love that because it, it took a long time for it to make sense to me because um, my very limited experience with Ayurveda has just been with watching other people do it. And I'm just like, I'm way too old to learn all this. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to learn how to whatever the oil in the mouth and the the different times of day to do to do this kind of thing. I, I just like I'm too old. I can't memorize something. But obviously I had it wrong and it's very, very um, organic the way you're going to care for yourself, this kind of self-care, and it's always there. We just have to become aware of it. It is there. It is. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the core thing is that the more we practice Ayurveda in a lived way, like an embodied way, the more we simply are syncing ourselves with the energies that are already present and the cycles of nature and the rising of the sun and the rising of the moon and the shifting of the seasons because those things obviously those things are happening and they're somewhat inevitable you know you're throwing out these gems so uh, a couple times i did a meditation and the person on the recording said something about you're harmonizing with all of creation and i just thought oh i love that 
Mm -hmm. um, there's certain gems that you say and you just throw them out there. And what you just said now was the word sinking. And that's S Y. Mm -hmm. You're sinking with all of nature, all around you, your physical body, your mind, your heart, and all of the nature around you and in, and including the universe. Right. And that's pretty profound. Yeah, it is. And yet very simple at the same time. Yes. You know? Yes. To think that we can do that. Yeah. So ultimately that's at the heart of the truth. Um, you started with philosophy, and I love how this is tying into your hunger for philosophy. And it is very weird that somebody 17 from Santa Clarita could be so hungry for something not only so ancient, but something that's not, uh, it was not on the forefront in 2007. I mean, we're, we're almost 20 years later now. We're 2023. Yeah, so, it's yeah. still not, but, but there is a little bit of a niche, you know, a little bit of a, like, let's say a cult following or whatever emerging. Well, and with the internet, more people are understanding it, but it, it was definitely fringy. For sure. And anything, anything in Santa Clarita was fringy if it wasn't yeah. the gap, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hit them all. So anyway, go on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as you say that too, I remember even when I was younger, you know, looking outside and being like, why, why is there grass everywhere? And like, why are there trees and lines? And why are there, you know, hedges and things? And then discovering, um, because my house is in a housing tract, but backed up against mountains. So I'd play on the mountains, which were the actual topography of the area. And I discovered a cactus one day and I ran inside and I told my mom, I'm like, mom, why is there a cactus outside? Like, I just discovered a cactus. What's going on? She's like, we live in a desert. And I was like, what? We live in a desert? I see green everywhere. There's trees and there's grass, you know? And she's like, yeah, that's that's what it would look like if there weren't any houses built here and there weren't any communities and we didn't water the, you know, the grass every day. And I was like blown away, you know, but it was like seen behind the veil kind of. Um, I love that. That's so true. Yeah. Seeing behind the veil, like this is like the Truman show. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, very much. I always had that sensation growing up in Santa Clarita that it was a little bit Truman show going on. But, um, yeah, I can't imagine if I grew up here because I came here, you know, at 23 and it was hard. I can't imagine being raised in Santa Clarita, especially during that time. Like right now I'm so used to it and it just is, but as it was right. developing into what is now Santa Clarita. Anyway, um, yeah. So, okay. So you you just had that uh, early early curiosity for truth, right? And how do I fit in too? Like, what am I doing here? How do I fit into this world of hedges and you know manicured lawns and whatever? And what am I doing here? And how do I relate to this world? Right. So Ayurveda offers that no matter what environment you are. You know, whether you are in the manicured lawn environment, but that's actually a desert because um, you can't you can't erase the desert. Right. You can make it green with, you know, sprinklers and stuff, but it's still a desert. And so you're still interacting every day with the with the truth of that desert, the heat and the sun and the cold and the sand and the winds, you know, the Santa Ana winds like that. That is present for us. Right. Um, and as I've, even as I've moved away and watched Santa Clarita over time and seen the fires and the prevalence of the dryness evolving over the years, um, increasing over the years, it's just more of that Ayurvedic truth, the writing on the wall, you know, and it's, it's shocking to me to see, uh, you know, to talk to other people about it and the, the kind of disconnect with like, why are there fires? What do fires have to do with global warming? Why would, you know, it's like, well, the, the more we don't have a water table, the more we don't have um, rainfall, you know, the drier it's going to get. Thus, you know, it's this cycle, right? And then the fires create more dryness and less, you know, like roots in the ground to hold the earth in place and, you know, more erosion is possible. And then it becomes a snowball effect, you know, and that's the interconnectivity point, right? Like that's the piece where, we are our environment. We're not separate from it. Just like the tree's roots aren't separate from the dirt that it holds and mm -hmm. from all those microorganisms in there that get washed away if there's, you know, a flash flood that results from, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so yeah, so that was like really the that moment of like, oh, we live in a desert. <laughs> and then that scene of, oh, this is, 
this is a basic truth that anyone can understand because it's like I said before, elemental. You're seeing it, you're seeing heat and cold and and wet and dry and you know, soft and hard. Like these are things that a baby can understand, right? Yeah. Um and so it, those are those are elements that you use in in this practice or this approach to life in Ayurveda. Right. Uh, those are called oh. the gunas. Called which I don't love to drop the ayur the Sanskrit because I think it scares people a little bit, but I just I basically just call them like the qualities, the qualities of life. These mm -hmm. qualities can can come together and form things, right? Like, and this is the where the creativity comes in. Mm -hmm. Is this is the creative force we're talking about? Ayurveda is a very poetic and scientific description of the creative force. Ah. And that's what's so profound about it. And that's why it's a profound healing system that if it if it really was given its due, it it can do so much because it's harnessing the the qualities of life itself, of the force of life, both within the body of the person, let's say the, the person being treated, the body of the healer, the environment, it takes all of those things. Like, can you imagine, you know, going to the hospital and like the doctor? like considering the fact that they, that you're in a desert, you're in the hospital in the desert, like how, how might that affect your healing process, you know? And like, sure, you know, in, in maybe Victorian England, they used to say, oh, well, they need to go to the seaside to heal or whatever. Um, and now it's kind of looked at as folky, but there was some wisdom in it. It was just by that time, it was so disconnected from, you know, the rest of the holistic view, right? But I think it's really interesting that the kind of the fathers of Western medicine were so informed actually at the time by Ayurveda coming out of India, like the humors in, in Greek are equivalent to what are called the doshas in Ayurveda, which is just these elemental combinations of thing, of qualities, right, that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so those humors or whatever, uh, that the Greeks used that terminology and that it still informed Western medicine anyway. And we, and we like to divorce ourselves from it and say, oh, well, that was all just like before we understood things, right? But no, it was just a way to describe what we hadn't yet had the technology. It's almost like we outsource our own wisdom to technology. And once technology affirms things for us, then we're like, oh, now we can believe it, <laughs> you know? Right. Well, I heard that bloodletting from leeches is back. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's also an Ayurvedic thing. So, man, we must've been onto something, but, um, I, I love <laughs> that so much. Um, and I don't love the humors, but I, I see what you're saying that, you know, there's this consciousness, right? This collective consciousness. And so whatever the Greeks were saying bled into Western thought bled mm -hmm. into, you know, modern medicine and whether or not it's true, the it's still under that foundation. And what's not under the foundation is what you were saying about being connected to the earth. That doesn't seem to be in our foundation. Yes, I remember in many books, yes, she needs to go to the ocean, to the seaside to heal. Little mm -hmm. did they know that those negative ions that the ocean waves blow blah, are healing. Like, yeah, they don't even know what an atom is yet or, right. or a molecule yet. And they're sending people to the ocean because it works. But Aside from that, I don't think that the connection to nature is in 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 it anymore. I don't know. Maybe far, pharmaceutically speaking, we don't even use plants anymore. We use synthetics, right? Right. So we are trying somehow to to replace to replace that with technology, you know, especially right. in pharmaceutics, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, okay. So I love what you just said too. That um, description. You said description of the life force itself. Mm -hmm. So Ayurvedic is, is a, it's not just a description. It's a way of looking at the world and of life that is already there. You don't have to do anything to, to believe it. Like we don't have to imagine that. Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything right now that wouldn't offend anyone. <laughs> so we don't have to make up um, an imaginary um, story about, um, I don't know. Well, let's just bring it back to Western medicine, I think, because that's probably like the, the easiest um, juxtaposition to make. Is there's, no, there's no like heroic story of discovery 
you know, like in Western medicine, there's this big heroic story. And even, you know, even people like, I can't think of his name, but uh, the guy who came up with the forceps that are used, is it forceps or the, the little cream? When you get a, when you get a, a pap smear, it's uh -huh. called, you know, the thing they put in you, it's really awful. It's it's forceps. It's forceps. Is it forceps? No, I feel like forceps are what they pull the baby out with. It's like, oh, a, yeah, those are forceps. oh this is that thing that um, just opens you up. thing that opens your cervix it's, and it's like metal and uncomfortable and yeah. awful. I yeah. can't think what it's called, but anyway. I've never known the name of it. Totally getting off subject. But my point is that there are so many stories of these heroic scientists who they subdued nature in some way, or they 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 extracted nature's secrets from her in some way, and then that that's they empowered humanity. You know, it's like the classic um, Promethean myth, really. It's mm -hmm. like stealing the fire, mm -hmm. and now we know something, mm -hmm. um, and that and we've subdued nature to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this it's this heroic and individualistic, um, and often um, like almost across the board male um storyline right yeah. and where whereas ayurveda is much more like i this in the course is this is how i see it is this is the soup right the primordial ex existential soup we find ourselves in how do we how do we put words to it mm -hmm. rather than like some kind of flash like a lightning bolt or light bulb going on you know it's it's intimacy with what is there's another golden nugget it is intimacy with what is so it's just almost impossible it reminds me of creativity it's almost impossible to just define when someone says what is ayurveda it's it's almost it's impossible really to define because we've called it a description we've called it an approach or you i call it an approach you call it a uh, worldview mm -hmm. um and now we're calling it it's an intimacy with what is and who could not want that yeah. Especially, you know, when all we do, not all we do, but a lot of what we do is scroll through non real, non intimate activity day in and day out. Right. Our longing for that intimacy with humans and with our surroundings is at an all time high. Absolutely. And there's a lot more disease now or more diagnoses or more disease or more names for disease or mental illness there's so much more now than there ever was yeah and I, I fundamentally think like yes there's more names and maybe there's more awareness but fundamentally when we look at the rates let's say of just suicide alone like there's something going on right um because the rates are exploding exponentially every year really um and well, so what metaphor, you know you cut off your own life because you are cut off from life Exactly, exactly. And that's what I always thought of kind of the postmodern worldview and the sort of existential, existentialist worldview is like, it's like we become so aware of ourselves that we become aware of how trapped in our own little tiny bubble of aloneness, right? And without the vocabulary that is offered by something like Ayurveda mm -hmm. to explain and describe and and put on uh put on our you know collective like altar right that's how i think of it is putting it up, like we we honor this we honor this interconnection with our words and with our descriptions and with um with giving ourselves that narrative right to to be able to do that um that i, I think is what you hit on is exactly like what ayurveda can give to the, this world this postmodern world where we've cut ourselves off at the roots literally you know well, um, that's, that's why, that's why, exis when did existentialism even get famous? You, you remember years? I mean, I remember Paul Sacht. Yeah. Early, early 1900s, right? That sounds about right. Yeah. Huh. I'm not good with the dates, but yeah, well, definitely you know, thinking of Sartre and I'm thinking of, uh, I, I mean, even like some Nietzschean ideas and nihilism and yes. And so all this idea of, you know, existentialism, which is meaninglessness, basically just bouncing around with no meaning right at the heels of the, you know, having the industrial revolution, bring us all this new technology and this separation from our food and a separation from our home and separation from each other, because then people just took off and, 
so many separations start happening. And so now we have the only thing to connect us half the time is look at us right now on Zoom, right? You live in, right. you live in Oregon, I live in California. Um, although we're, we're doing a bang up job of being truly intimate through this beautiful um, thing called the internet. So it doesn't have to be this way. And right. so, you know, tracing it back to, you brought up existentialism and I, I got off, but it's tracing okay. it back to what Ayurveda, the philosophy, the practice, the worldview, the intimacy, and the healing and the medicine that this thought form itself can bring um, will reunite us with what we're missing. And, and, you know, I always think that, you know, we share creativity as a religion and all I see are similarities right now um, between yeah. how I view creativity and um, our daily, our daily interaction with that, which is sacred. And that's, that's what you mentioned last time. So, okay, so you really liked this one professor at Cal State Northridge. Mm -hmm. And um, you had a lot of training. Yoga Yoga did a good job. But they did a great you, job. You went on to uh, take private um, courses, right? And have a mentor and... Yeah, so it's so funny because we're getting on so many topics that are are really juicy and worth talking about. But yeah, let's go back to the, let's go back to the theme because I think, you know, we might as well have a structure. Um, but yeah, so after Yoga Yoga, I... I guess maybe simultaneously with yoga yoga, I was doing my bachelor's degree. And so I was studying Western philosophy um, as well as Eastern philosophy because I couldn't leave them. I couldn't leave one out, right? Like I I wanted to see the comprehensive view of, of really a, like how we have evolved as a species and believing what we believed in different places and everything. And um, after that, you know, I did like Buddhism. I did a bit of Indian philosophy with Narayan and everything. And then, um, and then I was starting to, I guess like around that time I had moved to Guerneville in Sonoma County and I, I had been so heady. Um, I was so intellectual and very driven and, um, very, very ambitious and like to the extent that I just really got completely myopic about my studies. And well, so that had you, had you started your master's program yet? Yeah. 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 I and suppose, I think that that's yeah. what we talked about when, when, whenever we did talk, you were awfully young to, yeah. you know, you were awfully young to get your um, high school diploma. Then you were young to get your bachelor's. And then you literally started a PhD program or a master's program. Master's program. Um, yeah, as at like 20. And to study philosophy without that much life behind you, that would throw anybody off, right? Yeah, I think so. And and the thing, you know, I think the Western narrative is like, oh, existentialism and getting lost in all that. But but from an Ayurvedic point of view, it's really just about elements. It's about what was going on with space elements, air elements, fire elements, water elements, and earth elements. Very, 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 very low um, earth <laughs> and water elements and very, very high of the, all three other elements, okay. um, which what I mean, imagine fire, wind, and space. What what do you get? It's like a, a slight cyclone, right? Yeah, yeah. So like a lot of anxiety existential of course because that was the flavor of my my mind's you know narrative or whatever um and I wasn't embodying the groundedness like even though I moved to the woods and lived in the redwoods you know I wasn't embodying the groundedness in my life um and the water element being like the softness and the fluidity and the love right and the the ooey gooeyness of life um and so I I really didn't know what to do with it all. I was like, what do I do with all of this stuff? I wanted to understand the truth. I'm, I can see it that I've gained some kind of intellectual understanding and absolutely no practical understanding at all. And so of course I was like, well, shit, you know? And then of course, well, life... shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit, I don't know what to do. And then of course life showed up. I had a baby that got me real grounded real fast. And I learned a ton um from that experience like school of life for sure and when my son was one I moved to Thailand and I started studying yoga more in depth with the teacher um and I lived there for a year and a half on the 
the, the land that it was a permaculture farm and a yoga retreat center. Um, I lived there with that community studying with my teacher, um, studying yoga and Ayurveda and Indian philosophy. And uh, that's where I started to understand what integration could look like, mm -hmm. um, where all the stuff I had learned, all the knowledge that I had gained that was not wisdom, that was not anything really except fodder for my mind at that point, you know, um, I started to understand what integration could look like and what, what this teacher calls waking down, waking down into life rather than most of the religious traditions or many yeah. of the Western religious traditions are about transcending life, transcending our bodies, the dirtiness of the body, the dirtiness of the earth, the hell on earth kind of narrative, um, and trying to get out of it and escaping it. Whereas this tantric and Indian philosophy um, and many, many contemplative traditions, any kind of mystical tradition is about waking down into living and beautiful. being embodied. I love um, that. I never, which I think I've is never heard that. That's isn't new. it beautiful? And I, it's ultimately this to me is the story of Jesus of like look at God embodied in the world, living in the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. Um waking down. Yeah. So then so that began then and and it uh actually the real the real synthesis of it all was when I I had left that community after a year and a half of study. And I went to get a job and be a big girl and raise my kid. And I was a preschool teacher and working with the preschool students and nothing was more grounding. Nothing has been since more grounding than that experience of being with them every day in the classroom um, with no, it, any narrative my mind could come up with was just not relevant to the moment you know to being with them in the moment uh -huh. and as I think it really taught me how much I cause my own suffering by engaging in my own mental narratives wow um because when I was forced to drop it over and over and keep showing up in the classroom with these children it was like oh that was a like complete imaginary thing that I was like just soap right opera over, right head. yeah you know yeah and and actually it's just Plato. Like that's all that's happening right now, you know? <laughs> Not Plato, but Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Oh, I love it. How I love it. That little play on words. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, oh, you know, that just thrills me just to hear how transformative that experience of teaching and being of service um, to, to little ones has been for somebody so freaking intellectual and academic and so smart. And it just reminds me of you have to become like a little child, you know? Yeah, yeah. To understand. It's so true. And they, those kids really, they finished the job of what my son had really started, you know? They got, they got like the real root of the moment to moment. Cause even with my kid, I can take him where I want. I can feed him what I want. I can, you know, watch TV with him if I want. But in that classroom, there was not there was nothing for me to do but be present with them there was no escape what a yeah such a great learning experience and to see that they don't need to learn that they don't need to we have to relearn it we right. were like that once yeah 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 i mean they have no narrative yet right so there's no the very little sense of i you know they have a sense of oh i'm hurt i'm going to cry about it or i want my mommy or whatever but there's no narrative of who they are or what their yeah. worth is or any of that, you know? Yeah, um, stretch that a little bit too, because we did talk a little bit about the self and, you know, the word self-care is the real word right now. But when you say self-care, you don't mean self-care. You kind of mean emptying and losing that quote unquote self. And you just use the word narrative, like the children don't have a narrative yet. What you're saying is they don't have an isolated self yet. Like I am separate from this classroom. I am separate from you. Right. They don't, they don't have that separation from uh, others and from their exactly. environment uh, and, until later. So yeah. they're really great teachers in that regard. They are. And that, you know, they're in that like early stage of ego development where they're only just starting to differentiate and they're still somewhat animistic in the way they experience the world. They don't perceive themselves as separate from the group or the or even the mother figure. Yeah. Um, 
it's like still emergent, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not that they're like enlightened running around enlightened, you know, but it's that they, where we get tripped up is where in our heads, right? Because it's this little, it's like, okay, here's the like, uh, animistic emergent ego emergent. And then there's the mental egoic, right. Where we're kind of like freaking out most of us, you know, especially yeah. Western culture. Cause a lot of like Asian culture or, you know, from my own experience, seeing Eastern cultures is like that in, especially rural that you can bypass that stage because there's not such a, like I said, it's a, a narrative, right? It's the, yeah. like for someone like me who studied the narrative of, of philosophy, of thinking, like, of course I'm going to get entrenched, right? I'm going to get entrenched in thinking because that's what I'm doing, right? Um, but, but anyway, so that I think the mental egoic is where 99.9, .9, if not all pers like percent of mental health issues come from yeah. it, is the narrative of the mind and the energy of the mind mm -hmm. and some kind of, uh, like repetitious pattern that's driving that energy in a way that isn't productive and helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and isn't actually causing connection to the outer world, but it's causing disconnection and contraction from the outer world, you know? Mm -hmm. And like I said last time, not last week, but uh, I hate being that responsible for my own health. I hate that, you know? And, and it only, um, I feel like it only gets worse as I get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, I, at least I used to be able to sleep. Yeah. I'd be asleep, right? And so it, it only gets worse if you don't learn how to not tame, tame it like a monkey, but um, uh, ignore maybe your mind or learn, learn to live with it without letting it get you ill or, yeah. um, you know, really affect you. And that's, a, you know, that takes practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that I used to think of it was detached and I really misinterpreted detachment as uh, ultimately like dissociation. Okay, um, good, good. Because that whole word detach, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't attach to others. You need to detach. It is not disasso dissociation. It's not. No, not at all. And, and I really wish that a different word had been used for my young self, you know, reading books about Buddhism at 14 or whatever. Um, yeah. Because to me, it was, it was cutting myself off from my emotional. That's a psychosis. Yeah, it for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> if if and, that's how you really are, you're you're gonna be a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which yeah, I mean, the what I really wish and what what I've hear it referred to um, now in like some of the meditation circles that I'm in and whatnot is more of uh, not identifying with. So you would the emotion, you have the thoughts. Like we're gonna have the thoughts. The mind is gonna think the feelings are going to feel, you know, that's just life. Right. But it's saying that is not me. That is not who I am or what I am. It is an experience that's passing through me at this moment. I like that. Um, not identifying with. Yeah. Um, okay. So I love that your mentors were the, the little preschoolers. Yeah. I mean, I've had many, but they were, they were definitely up there. They mm -hmm. deserve um, that accolade. Yep. And, 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 and then go on, you went to get certified, right? Yeah. So after that, I'm, you know, I moved back to the States and I'm working in heady world again, like in content marketing, um, in computer land. Uh, I remember like one of my first days in the office, seeing everybody like walking around with their computers in their hands and everybody with their double screens, I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> you know, going from the classroom, being barefoot, playing with Play-Doh. And then like, I'm in like the talking heads world, <laughs> you know, I was like, Oh, what have I done? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so that was a really interesting juxtaposition, like really, really interesting. Um, and you know, it's, it's ultimately been, I was like, what I was going into it thinking, okay, well, if that was the most grounded I've ever been, and if that's what I learned from that, what can I learn from this situation? Cause I don't know, like now I know how little I knew then, so what do I not know now? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and just trying to be open. Right to, there, that's um, wisdom. Right there, that's wisdom. Just being like, nah, I don't know anything. <laughs> so, so I've been doing that for more than six years now, 
doing marketing in some capacity, some form or one other, um, editing, writing. And all, all along that time, I've been continuing to deepen my studies in Ayurveda um, by getting first a health coach certification, then an Ayurvedic um, wellness coach certification. And, you know, admittedly, like I had pretty much learned most of what I learned in my certification already, most, not all, yeah. um, from, you know, just like my teacher, I spent a year and a half studying with him. I learned, you know, in my, uh, teacher training course and everything, um, and from all the reading and everything. Um, and, you know, of course it's always wonderful and helpful to get things synthesized in a cohesive yeah. way. Uh, especially for the Western brain, we really love that linear kind yeah. of way of learning things. Um, and I also love that I I learned from Katie Silcox at the Shakti School, which is very much feminine form Ayurveda, what she calls feminine form, which really just means that it's it's this essential understanding of Ayurveda. Because let me try to back up and talk a little bit about Ayurvedic cosmology. I I talked about how in the Western view there's it's the male doctor, scientist, whatever, extracting the truth from the female nature, right? So there's this subduing, this subjugation kind of hierarchy, right? And it's like, whoo, look at the man triumphing with his wisdom, right, over the female. And this is, of course, just archetypal, right? In Ayurveda, and especially in this school of Ayurveda, that's not super colonial influenced or whatever, you know, it's, it's about what I said at the beginning is, arriving in the environment and becoming intimate with the environment, both at the body as environment and the greater world around us as environment, the, the community as environment. Um, and so it's it's arriving here in this um, this feminine world, right? The feminine world of the body and of the earth itself, which in many of the Western traditions is ugly and disgusting and meant to be transcended, right? But here it's just fully arriving and embracing and understanding it, not through subjugation, but through intimacy. I love that. And so that's why I love the Shakti school. Um, and that's why that had to be who I was gonna get certified with. Yep. Um, of course, Ayurvedic certification doesn't mean a whole lot because there's not a lot of governing bodies and there's not, you know, there's no tract for this. There's no, um, there's no like support ultimately for people to get um, insurance coverage or anything like that. Not yet. But, not yet. Right. Not yet. Yeah. And there, you know, there is, um, there's NAMA, the National Association of, Men what is it? National Ayurvedic, I, I don't know. NAMA is the one governing body we have, the National Association of, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Ayurvedic, what it starts with Ayurvedic something. I don't know. Medicine, Ayurvedic Medicine Association, National Ayurvedic Medicine Association I, is probably what it is. Yeah. Um, well, something yeah. you said earlier, um, and when you say the male and the female, um, uh, is that the yin and the yang? What do you call it in Ayurvedic? Medicine? Yeah, Shiva and Shakti. Shiva and Shakti. Yeah, yin and, and yang works. Yin and, yang. Yeah. and then Jung would say animas, anima, right? Mm -hmm. Annie, Annie, with an A, N, I. And mm -hmm. so, you know, in creativity, um, in my creativity circle, I'm not in a creativity circle, I was gonna say creativity circle. Um, it's, it's the masculine and the feminine and it's an energy and it's a cre creativity is the right brain, right? And the left brain is the conquering brain. So it doesn't have to be male or female, but the idea of process is huge for creativity for any creative act or for just living your life and knowing you're in process, you're in the process of becoming, you're in the mode of transformation constantly. And that reminds me a little bit of your approach with the whole Ayurvedic thing is it's not a thing to, oh, you have a toothache, let's pull your tooth, right? Mm -hmm. It's this holistic, long-term living in process of being connected so that you're healthy and so that your mind doesn't, you know, I don't want to keep using the F word, but I'm not smart enough to think of a good vocabulary word. Uh, so your mind, the way your mind is working, constantly chattering, doesn't F up your physical body. Right. And if you don't want to take responsibility for that, that's kind of negative, then take responsibility for being one with your surroundings and with your body and with, with life. Exactly. 
Yeah. And what, you know, what you're saying about like pathology in Western medicine, you know, we take out the tooth or whatever in Ayurveda. And, and I think the big difference here is really there's the gross and then there's the subtle and Western medicine is really good at understanding gross, like the physical measurable documentable, you know, that kind of stuff. And thus it's really good at uh, I'm going to do it backwards, but not use my hands, try not to use my hands. So the, the, <laughs> the trajectory of pathology, it, we're talking about the end, right? Um, we're talking about like the disease has manifested, it's measurable, it's, um, you know, manipulable, <laughs> manipulatable. Um, that's what Western medicine largely deals with. And Ayurveda deals so much more with the subtle and the invisible and the, the, the quiet and the gentle and the, you know, any of those more feminine qualities, right. Of, of the invisible, like what is underneath the veil. Right. And so Ayurveda has the potential to treat disease before it's disease. It can treat it in the invisible stages. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think Ayurveda has really profound um, potential for treating psychological disorders because we're getting down into the the non measurable uh, and the indefinable. You yeah. know, I love that you said pre disease. You know, we can. It is not preventative. Mm -hmm. It is not pre disease. It's a way of caring for your body, soul, mind, all of you. Um, that's going to have, uh, that's going to be a constant process. It's not like, okay, here, fix your back. Let me give you surgery. Right. It's, it's not a, a problem it's, fix kind right. of. A, it's not about of. that. It's just about that process of living in that deep state of connection and intimacy and the benefits of that for your mind alone are going to manifest in your physical body. And that's, you know, I know we want to talk about the invisible, we want to talk about magic, and we want to talk about the unseen, but the things that are measurable are that you, what we talked about two weeks ago, psychosomatic. You, you can you can give yourself um, a brain tumor. It, it's it's widely accepted now that, they, that there is a huge mind-body connection between your body and disease. Now, it's not completely up to you because as we talked about before, shit happens, you know, you've got your family history, your ancestry, you know, where you grew up around power lines, you have what maybe bad water, you have all kinds of other things that play into it. But why not just be as loving and intimately um, existing with truth to bring it back with truth that you know, instead of resisting and saying, I don't want to be responsible, I'm going to go to the doctor and get medicine and take drugs and be separate. Yeah. And, and I mean, that all said, like, if I have um, an acute disease, I'm going to the Western doctor, you know, like, there's no doubt about it. Um, and that's what's cool about what we have today is like, we have the recourse to deal with problems you know that that maybe we wouldn't have in the past and i am not part of the camp that's like you know you have to do like kind of the steve jobs thing where you'd have to do it all natural or else you've somehow given in or whatever um that is definitely not how i see things um but what i do see is that if we start off interacting with the world with this certain level of intimacy we may um we may just never even have a need for some of the more acute like emergency type of medicine and because... that's 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 what a, people like in jordan's my firstborn kid in his little circle that is what they live for mm -hmm. when when i said one day i was like i don't have time to like be thinking about my health all the time i can't be drinking lemon water i don't have 20 minutes in the morning whatever i said right that's what life is about exactly what, what do you mean you don't have time Exactly. That's what, what, what else are you doing? But from the Ayurvedic lens, you're, you're, you're actually planting the seeds for disease. When we, when we can't slow down, when we're, you know, what is the priority there? What is, what is it? If you trace it back to its root, is it making money? 
-hmm. Is it being so busy? You can't like feel your feelings. Like what is the root, you know? Um, and, and if we can't, us, sorry, go ahead. Us, we just, we forget all about our health. We just forget mm -hmm. until we get sick. We're like, oh my God, I'm so healthy. Usually I forget to think about health. No thought whatsoever for six months or, or whatever, right? Until something happens and then you go, oh, I haven't been thinking about my own health. I haven't been taking care of my health. I've right. Been, I've been poisoning myself. I've been drinking too much. Right. And I think the thing that's so important to understand is it's not like thinking of health like this, you know, wellness TM, like I'm into health. It's like, no, I just, I have a body. I exist in a body and I exist in time and space where there is, there is birth and death and there is decay. And so we, we know it's coming, right? We know it's coming and we know that we're here and that we want to make the most of every moment that we're here because it is short and it is finite. And so it's not about like, I'm into health, like as some identity and you know, you you're dotting your I's and you're crossing your T's or whatever, or that you're trying to chase um, immortality either. It's, it's really about like, okay, I'm in this body. How do I fully show up to this moment? And how do I ensure that I'm making the most of being in this body in every moment? I'm so glad you explained it to me today and two weeks ago. It is, it's never really been explained to me. And as I said, I've seen like my kid, I, I've seen it and I've heard it, but it's never really made a lot of sense because it just seems overwhelming. But that yeah. whole idea of intimacy and process and um, and just of the isness, the existence of these things anyway, that turns me on as an artist and as a human, because that's why I'm so afraid of all the meditations and transcendental this and detachment that, I, that does not excite me. That makes me feel like, no, I can't lose my humanity. I won't. Yeah. I don't and that's, ultimately I that's not the point, right? Like, I, uh, I wrote an article about this recently when I was studying Indian philosophy and I was reading one of the translations of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika by, uh, I can't remember who, and he said, to the enlightened mind, sex is like rubbing two sticks together. And I had this moment of like, that can't be right. That cannot be, you know, that to me sounds like dissociation, right? And so at that time, I, I was like, to me, it's, you know, becoming more embodied, more intimate, more, um, more familiar and more sensual with our actual experience, not for the sake of sexual pleasure or not because we identify as a male or a female and we're trying to get laid or whatever, but because we're in this body to use this body as a vehicle for full comprehension of life, right? Full. Mm, that's so beautiful. Full comprehension. Because when people say the word abundant, right? I mean, I just, I just, I don't, I, or bliss. It's mm -hmm. been overused. Full comprehension is something I can wrap my mind around and my heart. I love yeah. that. I, I, and to fully, to fully immerse myself in this thing called life. It's mm -hmm. one big poem. It is. It is. Yeah. And we're just, our minds spinning. And I always say like the, the poetry is like the pace of God, right? Mm -hmm. And so when the mind is spinning, we can't imbibe of that poetry that's going on all around us, you yeah. know? So beautiful. I love it. When the mind is spinning, we cannot imbibe in the poetry that is going on all around us. I'm telling you, I'm making a meme. <laughs> I love <laughs> Do it. it. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope we were somewhat linear. Um, in I my think mind, we, yeah, we did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in my mind, it, it's just, it's all so connected. I can draw a little map and draw, connect all the dots. Yeah. Uh, it's utterly profound. And whenever you and I discuss, um, obviously we, we can't hug each other. You know, we can't drink anything. We really just get to share whatever we're thinking it through our words and our hearts. It's just really magical to me. Yeah, I agree. So thank you. Okay, so... Shall we do yeah. a meditation? We are quite over, but I think it's fine. So let's just go ahead I and have my glasses on. I have no idea what time it is, but let's do it. It's 610. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, we got going. We did, which I'm is not, great. Yeah, so Okay. I'm yeah. going to co cover my face and mute myself. Mwah. All right. So let's go ahead and drop into the body. And just feel yourself on the seat that you're sitting in. 
Feel your hands resting on the thighs. Feel the breath. Just tuning into the qualities of being in your body, in this life, in this moment in space and time. The simple movements and sensations. Feeling the structure of the body occupying space from the head to the toes and everywhere in between. Feeling the skeleton holding you upright. Feeling that subtle effort of the muscles holding the skeleton upright. Sensing the structure of the body. Feeling the breath as it rises and falls, as it fills the belly and the chest. The chest moving like a bellows. Oxygen moving through it, entering the body, enlivening the body, the bloodstream, oxygenating the cells, the brain, every part of the body. And the exhalation as the breath leaves the body. Sensing all of this activity existing simultaneously along with the stillness. The stillness of the physical body, the stillness of the awareness watching, this dynamism and aliveness. The simultaneous stillness and motion of life in process. And seeing any so called negative experiences as just another part of that process. Any unpleasant sensations, uncomfortable feelings and emotions, as well as the thoughts. Any thoughts, whether they're distracting or discouraging or simply unrelated, just letting that be a part of the process as well. Like a waterfall, the thoughts trickle down, just like the water flows. And you can let that water flow on by without getting involved, without changing the flow.
I'm just letting that trickle continue if that's what it's doing. Centering the awareness on that stillness. that hosts the rest of all of that activity. Noticing that the awareness emerges from that stillness as well. Notice in the midst of all of that, if you can sense an inherent pleasure and simply breathing. And simply being, existing. And the simple pleasure of aliveness. And then as you're ready, you can start to externalize your attention, feeling the body sitting on the surface that you're sitting on and sensing the space around you, the room that you're in. Sensing yourself in the greater context, greater environment that you're a part of, that makes your existence possible. And then as you're ready, you can Gently flutter the eyes open. And release the hands. And come back. Thank you, thank you. I'll see you in two weeks. All right, take care. You too. Mm -hmm. Bye.